church family. We are so excited that you are gathered here with us this morning. And I just have a couple announcements for you guys. As you guys may have heard, Trunk or Treat is happening here on October 31st. And we are so excited about that. And if you have want to donate bags of candy for Trunk or Treat, there's some trash bins right around here. You can drop off your candy to donate for that. It is going to be a great time. So get your costumes ready and get your trunks ready. Decorate it. It's going to be so much fun. It's going to be a blast. Also, if you're new here and it's your first time here at The Rock, there is a new here tent corner right outside. Stop by there on your way out. We have a gift we want to give to you just to thank you for joining in with us this morning. And we are just happy that you're here. Also, if you've been coming to The Rock and you want to get teamed up serving with us, stop by the Connect Corner on your way out. There will be some awesome people there who are going to give you more information about what that looks like to get teamed up. And we are just so excited that you're here. Hola, buenos días. Um, bienvenidos a La Roca. Mi nombre es Kimberly y sirvo aquí a la iglesia. Uh, si no lo sabes, ofrecemos ese servicio a las once y media en español. Um, si le gustaría escucharlo um, en este idioma, ofrecemos um, una aplicación que puedes bajar en su celular. Um, te invito a visitar a la carpa de bienvenida si le necesita ayuda con eso. Y um, espero que disfrutes tu tiempo con nosotros hoy. All right, I'm going to grab a cup of coffee and just take a moment, greet somebody next to you, and let them know that you're happy there at church. And we are going to get started here shortly. You don't deserve it. The truth you never volunteer. You keep it locked up. It's written in your West Coast tears So far from us, so far from us So when the vanity fades and you're finally brave and tired of treading water I'll be waiting back home in the places you know I'll be right here when you wanna You can drown in West Coast tears When Hollywood gets Hollywood Let's stand to our feet as we get ready to worship. We're here to give him all praise this morning, to sing out the name of Jesus. Let's do that together. You're the author of every story. 
I love those words, you know, that we, we live in a world where people are searching, and what I love is the fact that nothing else will do, we just want you, Jesus. And with that, we know that Jesus is the, the provider that we all need. You know, whatever our situation is, he shows up every single time. And uh, for that, I'm, I'm super thankful, and, and there's nothing I'm really thankful about right now, and um, last week, uh, Timmy, 
he challenged the church uh, to have a hundred thousand dollar offering, and uh, well, that happened. That's 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 really exciting, isn't it? It's incredible. And uh, because of that, we were able to order the flooring for our uh, new kids' wing as well as our special needs area. Uh, and then we're going to be able to get that installed soon. That's a really, really exciting thing. That really advances the process. And uh, that right there is just another example of, of Jesus uh, providing. And this way, he, he uh, provided through his people. And uh, we are thankful for that. Um, I know that's, this is a whole team effort. Everybody was involved with that. So thank you guys so much. And uh, it's such an exciting thing. Um, And I'm excited about today too, because uh, we've had an incredible morning so far, but it's not done yet. And we are starting a brand new series today called Skeletons in the Closet, because we've all got these things in our past. We've all got these things in our lives that we've tried to hide away, that we've tried to put away, these skeletons in the closet. And what we need to do is bring them into the light and have a conversation about them. And and one of the ways we're going to do that today is uh, we have a good friend of ours. His name's Chris Duncan, and him and his family have been coming to The Rock for a while now. And uh, uh, he's an old pastor friend of uh, my dad's, our lead pastor, Josh Fankley. And uh, and we just go way back. He's, he's an incredible guy, and he's been sharing a, his powerful story today uh, and on Thursday night. And I'm excited to see uh, that play out during this service as well. Um, but one thing we want to do, just so you guys get an idea of kind of this idea of skeletons and closet, is to kind of check out this little video uh, that was made uh, a few weeks ago. So if you guys do me a favor, go ahead, grab a seat, and uh, check out this video. How we doing, Rock Church? Come on now. I'm going to hear you. There we go. Welcome. My name's Chris, and uh, I'm glad to be with you today. Uh, uh, just, a, just a couple of side things real quick. Let, let's give it up because there's a lot of people joining us online, so welcome the folks online. Some of you are part of our Spanish-speaking service, and if you are, hola, como estas? Mi llama es Cristian. So we're glad that you're here today. Let's give it up for those of you who have joined us as a part of this. Thank you very much. And, uh, and so I, I want to say something a little bit sidebar because some of you uh, are uh, people that maybe go to church on a regular basis and that type of thing. And uh, October is a Pastor Appreciation Month. And I know that many of you drop your kids off in kids' areas and the wings and all those kind of things. And guys like Clay take great care of your kids. And so I just want to encourage you maybe sometime this month either to write out a note or if you feel inclined to, maybe even a gift card of some kind. And uh, for the staff around here because the staff do an awesome job and uh, just th- think a great way to encourage them in the course of this. Yes, let's uh, let's give it up to them. 
Let's, get, let's jump right into where we're heading here today because this idea of skeletons in the closet, you know, I, I've, I've used the phrase a few times. You probably have used the phrase a few times, but, but I never really, decide, never really dove into it to find anything about it. And so I went to Wikipedia because they know everything and uh, found out uh, that uh, the idea here, Wikipedia puts it this way, that skeleton in the closet evokes the idea of someone having had a human corpse concealed in their home so long that all of its flesh, I love this, had decomposed to the bone. And I love that phrase. I love that decomposed to the bone. Matter of fact, after doing some research, I discovered that they think that the term skeletons in the closet actually came from England in the early 1800s where medicine was really starting to take off and doctors were actually going to, to, to funeral homes and stealing corpses and they would do their experiments on those corpses and so that their family and others didn't find them, they would take the corpses after an experiment and they'd put them in the closet and then they would just sit there. And if you know anything about dead people, there's a couple of realities for you to note. Number one, if somebody's dead, they don't move much, okay? So I just want you to know that. If somebody's dead, they're not going to move much. But here's the second thing about somebody who's dead. A dead person begins to stink, okay? Now, and I'm not asking you to do that next time you're at a funeral, you know, sniff the coffin or anything like that. I'm, I'm just, just want you to know that because the longer somebody's dead, then the longer, the more that they tend to stink. And, and here's the idea of skeletons in the closet for us to begin to figure out, is that for most of us, the things that we keep hidden, the things that nobody else knows about us, the things that we keep behind us, oftentimes there is a smell that the people who are closest to us know about. They recognize it. They may not be able to place their finger on it, but the thing that happens is they know that there's something that's there. And so you do everything you can to mask it. You put on extra deodorant. You put on extra spray. You try to do whatever it takes so that nobody Nobody else knows it, but the people who know you the best know there's something just not right. And today what I want to do is I'm going to talk about one of my favorite stories about Jesus and ways that he dealt with this idea of skeletons in the closet, some that are public, some that aren't so public. And the things that, how he worked and how he did that. And so if you have a Bible or an app, then I would encourage you to open it up to John chapter 8. If you're online, open it up to John chapter 8. You can follow along with us because I'm going to camp out in the first 11 verses. We're just going to stay there all day long because this story is such an incredible story of Jesus and what happens and how he confronts these ideas. Starting in John chapter 8, uh, verse, verse 1, it says, Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning he was back again at the temple. A crowd soon gathered because they loved hanging out with Jesus. He was such a kind man, compassionate man, but the reality is, is that Scripture tells us he taught in a way that nobody else had heard before, where they were like, whoa, listen to this guy. And so what is he doing? He sat down and he taught them. And as he was speaking, the teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees, let me just say this, the pastors and the elders, the leaders of the church, brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery, and they put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they demanded, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her, what do you say? They were trying to trap Jesus, for you to understand, into saying something they could use against him, but Jesus stooped down and he wrote in the dust in his finger. Show of hands, how many of you have ever been interrupted any time in your life? Anybody here? Okay, good. Many of you? How do you respond when somebody interrupts you? You ever thought about that? Because for some of us, uh, we have different types of responses. I'm a dad, and I have uh, children that are young, and, and I have teenagers. And for some reason, whatever happens in my life is that I can go through an entire day, and none of my kids talk to me until the phone rings. And then when the phone rings and you answer the phone, you're like, hello, all of a sudden, my teenage daughter who hasn't talked to me since she was seven wants to come over and, you know, dad, 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 dad. And, 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 it's, and it's that, right? It's not just, you know, kind of a tap on the shoulder. It's the dad, 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 dad. And it's kind of in repetition. Dad, 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 dad. 
And I've learned that, that I have three responses, I have three levels of how I deal with interruptions in those moments. The first level of interruption for me is that I do that gentle uh, one finger up, just kind of looking at them like, just a minute, I'll get back with you. You know that. And so I'm on the phone, and you know, hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then, dad, 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 dad. And you're... Now, any of you in the room who have kids or know, have kids around you, how often do you think that works? Yes. How about never, right? So then I got to go to level two, right? And so level two is where you're in that moment and you're trying to have the conversation and now it becomes a little more threatening. So now it's not just this and it's more defined. You're like, eh. now it's the, I want to kill you. So you're like, yeah, 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 right? So you're on the phone and you're looking at them like, hello, I will cut your head off if I get a chance in a moment here. I love you, but this person I'm trying to talk to on the phone, right? And then that works, you know, maybe 40, 50% of the time. But then the other 50% of the time, they're still going, dad, 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 dad. So then I go to level three and level three is the worst level of all, right? Now, you don't remember if you put them on mute, who you're talking to. You just put the phone down, and you're just like, I'm saying you're talking to somebody. Blah, 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 blah. Shut up. And, then, and all of a sudden, you, you pick the phone back up, and you're like, oh, hey, hey, how's it going? Good, good to talk to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Here's Jesus being interrupted. And there are two interruptions in this story. I don't want you to miss this. Because the first one is Jesus. And what happens in the middle of his interruption? The Bible says... He goes to the dust of the ground, he takes his finger, and he starts doing things. Now, I don't, I don't know what he's doing. Uh, scholars have suggested, some say that maybe he's writing down the sins of those who are accusing. Others believe because obviously he was there when the law was written, and they're trying to tell him about a law that he was there when it was written. Maybe he's writing down the law. I don't, maybe he's playing tic-tac-toe. I don't know exactly what Jesus is doing that moment, but that's his response to an interruption. That's one type of interruption. But the second interruption in this story is the lady. And I want you to understand this because many of you in the room understand that that's a, a kind of interruption that happens to all of us. Our kids are trying to get a hold of us. They're trying to talk to us. But then there's an interruption that occurs in your life that absolutely changes everything after that interruption. Maybe, for instance, you've had a time where you got a phone call and you picked it up and you thought, hey, it's the doctor's office. I had a doctor's appointment earlier this week and had some tests ran. And you pick it up and they say, hey, sit down. We've got some news that you don't want to hear. That's a change of an interruption. Maybe for you, an interruption that you've had is that you knock on the, there's a knock on the door and you open the door and there's a friend that you're standing there and you're like, hey, I didn't know you were coming over. And they look at you and say, hey, wait a minute, you need to pause because so-and-so who's really close to us just died. It's an interruption that changes you forever. You know what those kind of interruptions are like. Some of you in the room know the kind of interruption where you hear the knock on the door and you open it and it's a stranger and you have no idea who they are and they hand you an envelope and you open the envelope and you find out that your marriage is done. It's papers of divorce. It changes everything. And this is the kind of interruption that this lady had. You see, you have to understand something about this. According to what Scripture tells us here, that the idea of these guys saying that this woman was caught in the act of adultery. There was a book that, that was often referred to known as the Mishnah. And the idea of the Mishnah was to take Old Testament laws and explain them a little better of how you conduct those laws. And in the Old Testament, in the book of Leviticus, the 20th chapter, there's a statement that says you shouldn't commit adultery. You shouldn't have sex with anybody outside of your spouse. And yet what happens here is that in that, they, they are like, okay, well, I don't know how that works. How do we know that somebody did that? <clears throat> because in the Old Testament... All was going on is that a lot of people were just saying, hey, this person had an affair on me. And they were like, oh, and so they stoned the person. That's what was supposed to happen. And here we are in this passage. And over the years, the Mishnah said, we've got to figure this out. And so in order to do this, we're going to get smart. We're going to have to have proof. And what they stated is that two people had to be eyewitnesses to this event other than the people involved. So let me just bring this down to you. The gal is thinking to herself, hey, I got some time. 
I'm going to call my boyfriend on the phone. And so she calls him on the phone and says, hey, why don't you come over? And he's like, okay, sure. And so he comes over. And they're sitting on the couch. And she looks at him and says, hey, would you like to watch one of those Lifetime movies? And every guy who's only in a dating mode says yes, right? Now, if you're not in a dating mode, you're like, Lifetime? Whoa, no way, right? And so she's like, sure, let's do that. And so they're sitting there watching a Lifetime movie. He puts his arm around her. They start kissing. And eventually it kind of leads to a place where they're like, hey, let's go to the bedroom. And so they're heading back to the bedroom. And then here they are in this moment. They take their clothes off. They're in the middle of this. And they're getting ready. Whatever noises are there. And then, boom, the doors open. And according to this, a religious leaders, imagine your pastor and an elder opening the door and saying, aha, we caught you. That is exactly what happened to this lady. And she went from one of the most intimate moments in her life, having an incredible experience, to being accused in the next five minutes of what will eventually lead to her death. Now there's a lot of questions here. Because according to the Old Testament law, why didn't the guy come? Was he in on it? Did these guys pay him and say, hey, here's the deal. Get this girl in bed, and maybe once you get her in bed, what we'll do is then we'll have that moment. We'll all come in, and we'll pull her out. And so here's what happens. They pull her out, and they rush her somewhere from wherever she was, maybe 50 feet away, maybe a half mile away, and they're pulling her and dragging her. You know why? Because these religious leaders didn't care about her, and they rush her, and they bring her there. And here's Jesus having a conversation with people around him. He's teaching them about God and his love and his compassion and these religious leaders come in and they take this lady and they throw her on the ground and they look at him because they've been trying to figure out a way because all of these misfits all of these people who are different all of these people who are outsiders they found Jesus and all of a sudden they found somebody who loves them and cares for them and they're like we can't have that he's disrupting our system he's disrupting our world and so they throw her in front of Jesus and there's their trophy and there she sits, absolutely naked and, uh, and totally ashamed. And they say, here, we found this woman in a way that she wasn't supposed to be. And the law says to kill her, what is it that we should do? Now, I don't know about you, but the thing about it is that those kind of interruptions change everything about our story. You know, the thing is, is that there's Jesus in that moment writing in the sand. And the Bible tells us in verse 7, as we continue through this, the Bible says they kept demanding an answer. Hear this. They're not just walking up to him saying, hey, dude, we got a problem here. What do you think we should do about it? No, they're demanding this. They're now standing there with a person that they could care less in front of them, and they're looking at this teacher who they would not call a teacher because they didn't respect the guy, and they're just saying, dude, what are you going to do? What are you going to do with her? I would assume that maybe even at this moment they couldn't even look at her because they're more interested in blaming Jesus and then here's Jesus writing in the sand, and they continue to demand, what are we going to do? What are we going to do in this moment? And I love this. The Bible says this is one of two times that Jesus stood up. And he stands up and he says, all right, you want an answer? I'll give you an answer. Any one of you who have come into this moment and you have never sinned, you toss the first stone. It's interesting to me. There's a Christian author named Philip Yancey who wrote a book called What's So Amazing About Grace? And he takes this story and he says that most of us read this story and see two groups of people. There's the unrighteous, the lady caught in adultery, and then there's the righteous, the people all holding stones. But the truth of this story is, is there's one whose sin was exposed, and there were people holding stones who never had their sins exposed. And so today, skeletons in the closet, I want to speak to those of you who've had your sins exposed. 
I want you to know that I understand some of your pain. I've been there. Let me tell you what happened with my story. Several years ago, I remember sitting at a restaurant, and in the course of sitting at a restaurant, I can remember the exact restaurant it was, the table I was sitting at, and the very seat that I was sitting at when my wife discovered that I was having a sexual affair with somebody who wasn't her. You see, I'd had this porn problem for years. And nobody had ever caught it. It was a destruction of a relationship. And there was a season in my life when I was single. And I let that porn problem turn into a full sexual addiction. And in the course of a season of my life, I just allowed myself to do whatever it was that I wanted. To be able to do those things. And here's the problem. I left a double lifestyle. I had a group of people on one side. And this group of people thought that I was this nice, righteous, religious guy. And then I had this group of people on the other side who had no idea that those two worlds existed. And then on this day in June, boom. My wife reaches across the table, picks up a phone, and she looks at a text message, and my entire world crashed. It was an interruption that would change me forever. Later that day, she took our kids. They hopped in a car. They ran to a hotel room. I tried to get answers or talk or whatever I could. I was trying to figure out what was going on, how I could help, what I could do, but I'd done enough. Two days later, my wife texts me and she says, hey, I want you to know, I'd like to sit down and just talk with you. Okay. And we sat down and unlike this story, my wife looked me in the eye, she gave me the most incredible hug I've ever felt in my life. And she said, I love you. We're going to figure this thing out. Three and a half years we spent in counseling. Three and a half years we walked through a journey of what was happening and why. And why in the world would this happen? Very different in this moment. And then fast forward nine years later, six months ago, I get a phone call from a mentor of mine. He says, hey, let's sit down and have a conversation. Sure, no problem. I come in and sit down, and he looks at me, and he says, hey, I know who you are. And I said, okay, good, I'm Chris. What do you mean you know who I am? And he said, no, I really know who you are. Somebody had done a deep dive search in my world and discovered the addiction that I had nine years earlier, and they had taken all of this information, handed it to a mentor of mine, handed it to the church leaders that were around me, handed it to all the people that they possibly could, and it was information, not just general information, but specific information, people that I'd met, screen names that I'd had, places that I'd gone, text messages, phone calls, the entire list of everything that I I had done during the course of that addiction in my life and this man stood before me and he held the stones and I can tell you for an hour and a half he threw stone after stone after stone he said you have been exposed he said you will never preach again you will never be able to stand in front of other people and an hour and a half with a sense of hatred I felt a sense of judgmentalism he sat there and he threw stones after stone after stone and some of us in the room know what it's like to have our sins publicly exposed a small drinking problem you're driving down the road you had one more than you thought you should but you can stop at any time and the police lights come on and now you have a record your whole life is turned upside down It was just one pill to help with the pain because for you, there was a pain that you had for a long time and that one pill turned into two and then turned into daily. It turned into every couple of hours to try to deal with the pain. And the next thing that you know is that you walk into a room and every person that you love is sitting around a couch and they're saying, hey, we need to have a conversation. It changes everything. Some of you know what it's like to be publicly exposed. But that's not the only group of sinners in this story. Because you see, there's another group of sinners in this story, and the sad part is, I'm part of that group too. 
They're the ones who were private sinners and their sins weren't ever exposed. These are the individuals who sin differently than you, but they're willing to condemn you for your sin. These are the individuals who will do whatever it takes and maybe even have their sin publicly acknowledged and accepted. These are the individuals who maybe struggle with greed and they spend more time looking at their checkbook and how it's growing than taking the opportunity or the time to discover more about Jesus. These are individuals who have a private shopping addiction and nobody else knows about it, but they continue to keep it going on and as long as it's held in check, it's not a big deal. These are the ones who have so much pride and, and arrogance that they make sure that everybody else is in the wrong. They make sure that they're going to point out to everyone else, but none of us are ever going to be able to come to them. Why? Because they're the righteous. They're the ones. And for many of us, people stay away from the church because so many of us have been those people who have sins and we act like we've never sinned in the course of our life. And Jesus, standing there, we demand an answer, don't we? And I love this. He says, those of you who are without sin, cast the first stone. And what happened? One by one, the stones were dropped. The people walked away. And as we head into a time of response, as we look at how Jesus responded in these moments, the purpose of this series is for every one of us to take an opportunity and to begin to look at what's going on inside. What are the skeletons in our closet? Some of them are exposed. Some of them have never been exposed. But what are the skeletons in our closet that people look at, that people may see, and we think we've covered up the stench, but other people know it and they recognize it? You may have tried for years and thought, hey, this is okay. Maybe for you, the skeleton in your closet is, a, is an anger problem that nobody else knows about, but it comes out every once in a while on the 501 when somebody cuts you off, right? Because you're not telling them they're number one for a reason. Maybe for you, it's the kind of thing that you're thinking, hey, you know what? I don't really like these kind of people because I don't like the sin that they have, and I hope that someday God comes down and judges them for the things that they've done. And so you have this sense of pride and arrogance because you're standing there on the judgment seat making sure that other people know that. Maybe for you, you're the person who everybody else thinks is good and righteous, and you know that there's something secret inside of you. Maybe it is a secret porn addiction. Maybe it is a secret alcohol addiction, and you know that nobody else knows it, but you can control it. You can make it work. You can make it happen. And the goal of what we're trying to do in this series is to get you to a place to where you bring it to the light. Because in this story, one person's sin was exposed, and it was brought into the light. And in the course of it being brought into the light, the second time that Jesus stood up after he said, any of you without sin, cast the first stone, everybody leaves, and then Jesus goes back down, starts writing again, and then in verse 10 it says this, he stood up again and he said to the woman these words, and I want you to hear this today, because I know that for some of you who've had your sins publicly exposed, you come to church week after week after week, and you still feel the pain and the hurt and the sorrow of that very day. And here's what Jesus says. He says to this lady, he says to the, I love this. He says, hey, where, where's your accusers? Where'd they go? Here's what I've learned about moments like that is that people love the flyby, don't they? They come in, here's your sin. I'm exposing you. And they don't stick around with a hug. They don't stick around and say, look, but we're going to walk through this together. More times than not, they say that, and then boom, they're right out the door. And you're left there. And for those of you today who have this going on in your life, publicly or privately, Jesus says, where are your accusers? 
didn't even one of them condemn you? And the only words this lady says in this incredible story is no, Lord. Jesus took what was in the darkness and he brought it into the light. So how do we do that? How do we do that? Let me just tell you this. I don't condemn the person who confronted me. And you know why? Because God wants to work on my sin and I'm not the one that needs to help them work on theirs. And part of the problem for most of us in these moments is it's so easy to say, well, they said this, or they did that, or this happened. And for me, that's not the case. What God brought me to was a passage in the book of Psalms, the 139th chapter, where David would write these words. And listen to me, because I want everyone for you to have this as your prayer today. Search me, O God. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Search me, O God. And then listen to the next words because I think it's incredible. He says, point out anything in me that offends my family? No. That offends the people around the block? No. That offends others? No. That offends God. Maybe the sin that you have is a sin that's acceptable to everybody else in the world. But if it offends God, then maybe he needs to convict you of that today. And here's the best part. Amen. And here's the best part of this. Only when it's brought to the light can God do something with it. Here's the end of that verse. All of this happens, and so Jesus looks at her, and his final words are this. Where's your accusers? She's like, I don't know, Lord. And he says to her, then I'm not going to accuse you either. Neither do I. Go and sin no more. Amen. Search me, oh God. Search me. So here's where I'm leaving the challenge today. I'm leaving the challenge for you to ask God to search you, even if your sin was public and you're sitting there saying, but but Chris, that doesn't do anything for the shame. For you to understand something. Most of us don't understand, but one of the things the Romans tried to do is they made their crucifixion specific to the audience that they were around. And so the Romans knew that crucifixion was painful enough. They knew that crucifixion was horrible enough. But to the Jewish crowd who was very conservative in the way they dressed, very conservative in the way that they looked at each other, who covered their bodies because they wanted to make sure that people wouldn't be exposed in ways that they shouldn't, the whole concept of that is that the Jewish, the the Roman people understood this. And so when they crucified Jewish people, they crucified them completely Naked, And the reason behind that wasn't just because of the pain and the sorrow of crucifixion. It was there. It wasn't because of the public humiliation. It was because of this. If a Jewish man was standing on a tree and he was standing in front of all of his family and friends and he was completely exposed, it was the greatest amount of shame that could be put on him and his family. And the, and the religious people knew this and the Romans knew this and this is why Jesus didn't hang on a tree with a cute little diaper like you see in the movies he hung on a tree completely naked and exposed and the reason for that is so that he could bear your shame and bear my shame so he could bear our sins so that he could say if you are ashamed then I know what shame looks like if you are in pain I know what pain looks like if you've been hurt I know what hurt looks like. If you've been in a place that nobody else knows, I've been there. And he can look you in the eye today and say that. And so I want to encourage you today, search me, oh God. Search me, oh God. Because I know that for some of you right now, you know what your sin is. It's right in front of you. Man, and you're ready to do something about it. But for others of you, you're like, yeah, I kind of overcame all my sins. I'm, I'm okay now then pray that bold prayer, search me, oh God. What's offensive to you? And Find out what that looks like. So here's what I'm going to invite you to do. I'm going to invite you to stand. We're going to sing this incredible song about what Jesus did for us, a thank you song. 
And what I'm going to encourage you to do is move. And what I mean by that is in this next few moments as we sing this song, that you would be willing to move. For some of you, you need to go to the back where the connect area is. And you need to have somebody pray with you. We'd love to be back there and praying with you. Maybe for you, you're just like, man, I don't, I don't even know how to pray the prayer. Search me, oh God. Then let us pray it with you. Or maybe you need to confess and have somebody talk to you a little bit. We'd love to do that. For others of you, you need to come over here and just get on your knees before God and say, God, this is the moment. I'm coming to you fully exposed. And in that moment, God, I know I stink. I know my smell. But you want to redeem that and make it a beautiful scent. I want to do that. For some of you, you want to take communion. You know, the idea in the book of Corinthians about the uh, examine yourself is exactly this. It is the purpose of you looking deep inside of you and saying, Jesus, expose anything in me that you need to expose. And so here's my encouragement. Let's sing, let's worship, let's bring this to Jesus. And as we do, he looks at us and he says, neither do I condemn you. But he can only do it if you're willing to bring it to the light. And so today, I encourage you to bring this to the light. Search me, oh God, and let him search us. Let's praise.
from the darkness into glorious light. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to His name. Such boundless grace, the God of ages, stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven, the King of kings calls Savior, I'm yours forever, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Oh, hallelujah, praise the Lord. promise your buried body began to breathe and out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on the promise your very body
Aren't you thankful, church, that we have a living hope this morning? That whatever we've come in this place with this morning, we stand here before the King at the feet of Jesus with no accusers because our debt has been paid. Our sin washed white as snow because of what he did on the cross, because of his blood for us. In church, we have one response to that, and it's a spirit of thankfulness, and it's a song of praise. Because whether you feel like it this morning or not, he gets all of our praise. He gets our voice because he put the breath in our lungs to give it to him. And we have the freedom to sing. So I want us to go back into this chorus. And I want you to lift up your voice. I want you to freely lift up your hands to the King and surrender. And I want us to give Him all we have this morning, church. Cause He's worthy. Cause He's worthy. this morning because of the cross as we've prayed this prayer this morning of search me oh God and we've sang these songs of thankfulness and we've sang these songs of surrender let this not be an opportunity that passes in your life this morning to surrender your life to Jesus let's pray together God we love you we thank you we thank you for what you've done in us. We thank you for salvation. We thank you for the cross. And we surrender to you this morning, Jesus. We give you all that we have. And we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, it's been great worshiping with you. You have a great Sunday. We'll see you next week.